Great. Okay. Um, so, as for the last lecture, I'm going to keep my comments circumscribed uh, because I would like to to keep um, this discussion brief, um, and I would like to um, to make sure that where we do spend time, it's for key issues and issues where you might have questions. To address that need, before I dive into this topic, I first want to to, to engage in some dialogue, dialogue specifically around this issue of human ethics and um, uh, any concerns with respect to REBs, um, uh, institutional review boards, um, and uh, the, the ethics of collection of this uh, high velocity, high volume, high variety, and high veracity information. Are there any aspects of the ethical context that you folks would like to address. For example, I didn't go into physiological data specifically. Um, I didn't talk about um, you know, the particular challenges associated with uh, uh, studies that involve uh, uh, an intervention. For example, RCTs, which Ethicard's predecessors have been, have been part of. So any, any questions that people would like to discuss on the ethical front? Yes, Erica. With youth. With youth. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, the, have you had any studies where you had a, a young population that yeah. has been participants and, and consent? Yeah. How has that worked? I, I, I am so grateful for this question, and I stand before you negligent, uh, nay, uh, nay uh, also uh, inconsiderate for not having brought that out in my previous slides. I'm not sure, because I know I have slides about that, and maybe they're in this next deck rather than the earlier one. But uh, I'll make some, some comments um, on that. Um, there are, as everyone in the room will appreciate, there are unique features associated with um, conducting studies based on the characteristics of the participants. Whether it's older individuals with dementia, um, small children, um, teenage, uh, teenagers and adolescents, or young adults, um, uh, you know, there's very different uh, needs and vulnerabilities associated with different groups. Um, and we have conducted now uh, a, a variety of different studies with uh, younger populations, both in Canada and in, uh, in, in Europe, um, particularly I have in mind uh, Switzerland. Um, uh, I believe that there might have been some in the US that Mohammed is involved in, but I'm, I'm less aware of those. Um, so it's been predominantly, for me, uh, Canadian and European. Um, and within this context, um, uh, there are you know, a variety of, of, of special needs that one needs to address. Um, uh, so they include securing informed consent from guardians or parents, um, and assent for, for children who are older. Um, uh, so um, opting out um, in a way that may override parental permission or, or consent for involvement but allowing the older adolescent, for example, adolescents to say, look, even if my parents gave consent, I don't want to be part of this. You know, I, I, I feel that it's intrusive or, um, um, or, or too prying for me. This is notable because um, the attitudes of adolescents towards technologies and privacy within my living memory of the past six or seven years has evolved greatly. Actually, probably 10 years, I'd say. Um, there was a time where um, adolescents seemed to be blithely less concerned about privacy, just saying, well, it's, it's all taken. These days, my observation is many adolescents are have a degree of of extra uh, sharpness and concern and um, 
and uh, uh, not not cynicism, but but jadedness, knowing just how much information is being collected, and uh, therefore uh, sometimes opt into systems like Snapchat, which have you know shorter um, uh, vaporization of, as it were, of of, of uh, shared content and which uh, protect them against certain types of, of privacy risks. I think part of the uh, popularity of WhatsApp um, has to do with its encryption uh, and young people have, have opted, um, opted into it. So this issue of older children opting out is, is really important. Naturally, within this context, is a need to provide accessible explanations um, of study operating of motivations of benefit secured from this study in terms of uh, health health insights um, in terms of benefit to uh, society. There are unique concerns with uh, children, uh, minors, um, including adolescents, in terms of online behavior and screen time when it comes to giving a phone to individuals. Like there are some studies there are many studies we've conducted in, in earlier years, predominantly three or more years ago, where we gave phones out. We give phones to individuals because they were expensive enough that we couldn't assume um, widespread penetration in, in the studies, uh, in the study populations of interest. And among adolescents, there uh, was particularly concern, and among younger children now, there's particular concern, you know, are you skewing their experience and their, um, uh, their uh, health habits by giving a phone or, or by, by encouraging them to spend more time with the phone, even to just interact with the app? This is particularly a concern if you're giving a phone where they didn't have one before, you know. So a child of 10 years old and you're giving a phone. And, um, there, um, you know, one of my own perspectives would be try to see what you can do with beacons for kids rather than phones. So again, take advantage of this issue that, you know, we don't always need a phone to indicate a person um, to detect other study participants. Uh, a beacon, you know, placed on a child's, uh, you know, child's person in their backpack or whatever. Um, might be might be enough um, uh, with parental consent, and then we don't involve them with uh, screen time that they otherwise wouldn't have, have obtained. So, particularly for for individuals who didn't have phones, for for minors who didn't have phones, that's a big a big concern. My observation is that youth are often much more impatient with technology, um, expecting it to just work and expecting it to serve their needs often. Um, and one of the things Mohammed has found, this was in the States, that's right, um, was uh, a willingness to uninstall Ethica sometimes. So we had, we had one study which was run, I think, out of Drexel University. And um, it was, I think, conducted in a school, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not absolutely positive of, of this. It's possible it was the university students, but um, in any case, it was students. and. They installed the app, and no questions were to be asked for the next month or six weeks or something like that. And by the time that time elapsed, most of the participants had uninstalled the app, uninstalled Ethica. And so guess what? <laughs> the response rate for that next wave of the survey was very, very low. Because they said, what's this app doing on my phone? You know, I've got enough apps. I don't need, I don't need this app. By the way, this is one of these reasons why lessening the dependence of Ethica on the app, allowing Ethica to work without an app through a web-based survey instead as an alternative, um, to, particularly together with wearables, is very attractive. Because among youth, um, the observation is that often there's a certain willingness to uninstall technology they haven't interacted with in a while. So that's something to watch out for with youth. If you haven't asked them a question in the app and they say, what's this? I even I haven't done anything with that in a long time. I don't need it, you know. Um, I, I, it's, it's nothing to me, you know. It's not part of my day-to-day -day experience. I'm gonna get rid of it. Um, 
and, and not treating that with a gravity that perhaps it deserves. Um, uh, many of our studies with youth have been conducted through schools. Um, there's about a thousand youth throughout S Saskatchewan uh, in um, public, uh, Catholic, and, uh, and First Nations schools in our north that, uh, that are using Ethica as part of their um, school health assessments. Every year they were filling out forms before, and now they are working through uh, Ethica. Um, and there's questions about mental health and substance use uh, in light of cannabis legalization, e-cigarettes and the meteoric adverse rise of Juul, et cetera. And, um, and, and in the north, uh, in the, the uh, Northern Light School District, uh, there's a particularly strong presence. That's being led by my colleague Tarun Katapali out of uh, Regina. Who, who has a strategic vision I really admire. And he's gone to enormous work to work with, with schools, to recruit through schools, to bring parents and, um, and school administrators on board at great amounts of energy and time. But now that he's in there, it, it's you know, something that each year it's, it's an easier process. Um, it's a little bit like, it's inspired a little bit like the Compass study being being run by Scott Leatherdale out in uh, Ontario and I think now several other provinces, except they don't yet have Ethica. They, they'd like to opt into Ethica, but it's, it's a little bit further down. They're, they're in some of our papers together. So anyway, um, schools are a natural nexus for working with students, for achieving parental consent and student assent. Schools often have a strong interest in, in um, you know, promoting healthier living among students and knowing about mental health challenges and, and anxieties, et cetera, among students. Um, and so we've had a lot of success with them. And in the Swiss, Swiss study, which um, uh, Tina, sitting next to you in the corner, with which she has been one of the key people involved, um, uh, this is a study delivered in Italian for uh, the county of uh, the canton of, of Ticino, and it was studying. Uh, it is studying mobile uh, app use, um, screen time, and uh, mental health, um, uh, amongst other outcomes. It's part of a bigger study, so they have a a study of of youth, which involves traditional instruments and. They have, I think, what is it, Tina, for, for phase one, was it like 100 students? Um, yeah, 110. 110 students, and then phase two, uh, another yeah. group. Um, uh, and uh, th they went through um, uh, ethics for the major study. This is led by Peter Schultz at University of, of, uh, of Switzerland, U Lugano, University of Lugano. And, um, and then the, um, the ethics board especially went through for the, uh, for the Ethica survey, um, the Ethica component of it. Um, so there was you know, these, these basic elements. Um, what we did find is um, you know, uh, a, lot of, a lot of information on screen time, app use, et cetera, um, uh, through that study and a pretty good involvement uh, of, of the youth in terms of, um, of uh, um, sort of staying, staying adherent, as I recall. Um, Tina can, can talk more, more about that. And the first study, they are like more adherent, but for the second study, they didn't provide any incentives. So uh -huh. the adherence was actually less. And it is a student's age group 13 and 14, boys and girls. So. Mm. Do you remember what the incentives were? Like what level? Yeah. What was that monetary? Or was it like gift cards? I think it was gift cards as well. Um, and I, I don't remember the exact nature of the gift cards, but my sense was it was some sort of um, a, a, a redeemable uh, items they could use for, uh, you know, um, 
let's put it this way, not unhealthy things, you know, um, uh, things that would be, be attractive, and I could find out more, more about that. Uh, seems like that was a quite successful study by and large. It's interesting to hear about the second component, which I think Tina has just finished working with. Um, I will say this, um, uh, screen time, um, measuring screen time very well requires going beyond just looking at the nominal data that, that you saw earlier, like screen turning on, turning off, um, to take into account the fact that the phone is off sometimes and that the phone, in some cases, particularly if it's collecting a lot of sensor data, is kicked out of memory sometimes and then brought, to, brought back into memory. And Tina has done a lot of work in, in that uh, context very successfully. Um, minor involved studies, uh, uh, I will, let's see, what else can I say about, uh, about their involvement? Um, Oh, yes. Uh, so some work we did with uh, Harvard, which involved the next older age group. I think it started at 17 or so. Um, what we found is that within the context of some of these studies, we found a subset of the minors actually uh, became very, um, it would almost led to advocacy, health advocacy among some of the youth. They, they got involved in the study uh, heart and soul, and they they contributed to it and promoted for it. Um, and, and that was uh, an example I've discussed, uh, Erica, with you, involving mapping out the community on um, the uh, places where tobacco was being promoted. It became part of their calling almost to, um, to, to you know, try, to, try to contribute to the health of their community. And this is something that amongst minors, um, one can get uh, is you know a a real commitment to to taking this study to its um, to its natural conclusion and providing a study which allows that if possible that harnesses that energy of youth and that commitment of youth in a pro-social direction can be I think one of these distinctive things where if, if you went you know for adults who are working long hours and trying to manage families at home or juggling two jobs you're not going to get often that level of, of wholesale commitment into the study. And so that's an intriguing part of the human theater of working with youth, I think. Um, you know, beyond the nominal, um, you know, the things that are clearly involved and required for ethically conducting studies with youth, there's that ability to, I think, tap into the energy and, 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 and um, real verve of youth to contribute um, uh, in the, the health front. Um, those are some some comments there. Um, I think you know when it comes to the particulars of content, one has to be very careful. For example, in the context of mental health concerns, um, how one the, the 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 nature of the phrasing of the questions, the types of content one provides to the youth, as far as videos. Um, uh, opportunities to to uh, nudge them for the better. I think when dealing with a, a group that has uh, some extra vulnerabilities and uh, you know it's it's probably a good thing to involve someone who's worked a lot with youth as far as um, uh, you know other types of health studies to help craft that content so that it's least likely to um, uh, to be uh, upsetting to youth or um, or uh, least likely to turn them off through um, uh, through you know it's um, uh, it's patronizing sound uh, so those are some general comments apologies for not having uh, deeper comments on that uh, Mohammed uh, have, have there been other studies in the states where you've been involved with youth that you can that you can recall Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't believe, I, I can't think of it. Mm. Uh, I, I believe there were like two in the Right, okay. Okay. Um, and Tina, do you remember for the Media to Chino study in Lugano, did they hand out phones to the youth or it was already on youth owned phones? 
It's their own phone. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. I actually have a bunch of slides that I, I hid because I thought I'm not sure anyone's going to be interested in this. So I'd be delighted to talk about that. That's that's awesome. That's that's awesome. So um, uh, are there before I get to that because that gets into this recruiting and and retention and so on. Are there any other questions or discussions that folks would like to bring up right now on the ethics front? Yes. I guess Megan. if you're recruiting uh, online, yes, or like let's say you're using Amazon like Mechanical Turk. Indeed. How how does the ethics? How does consent and everything work in that situation? And right. Have you guys done that? Yeah. So um, so this is the AMT reference here. Um, so we have been involved with studies that have had remote recruitment. Um, uh, my recollection of an Alberta health service, health uh, study was that, uh, so this is by um, the health service delivery arm of, of Alberta, not to be distinguished, not to be confused with the Ministry of Health. There's kind of ministerial uh, jurisdiction and then there's uh, health service you know, healthcare delivery systems in Canada that are province-wide and are the purview of each province. And Alberta Health Services did an early study with, with Ethica. And Mohammed, can you help me remember, um, uh, there was a video made for consent, I thought, uh, in that context. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to remember. There was certainly a video. I remember you creating it and so on. Was that used for the consent process? Or was that in-person consent and the video was for extra information? No, the consent was a remote consent. Uh, you remember that, that I showed you a website that I said people could go to this website and then, or they can, there can be a QR code that points to that. Uh, the way that they sell that study is that they designed another website uh, that had the same functionality. So when you would go there on a smartphone, it would suggest that you want to uh, it, it would uh, it suggest that if you want to join the study, you can tap on that, otherwise you can learn more. And the website had all the materials that you needed to know to uh, become familiar with the study. There was a video, there were uh, other materials about the study. And then uh, when they would press uh, participate, they would be taken to this uh, consent form. Then they, uh, they uh, shared the materials of the website and the materials that was shared on this uh, on Ethicus uh, app uh, in their ethics application and used that as the way that participants could provide implicit consent. That's, that was the flow. So participant, th then they used a lot of different approaches, like for example, uh, yard, law, uh, yard uh, signs and then lawn signs and then the- Facebook, uh, Facebook, Facebook pages, even, even uh, radio ads to ask people to uh, go to the website. Mm -hmm. And when people went there, they would basically, when people would go there, they would download the app, and that would be the consent. They did that they wouldn't meet with individual people individually. Okay. Yeah, and um, was there a video involved? In the, set, in the website, yes. In the website, there was a video uh, mm -hmm. that would uh, talk about that, but there were other materials on the website as well. Right. And then there was a link in the app to that website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see, okay. Um, and uh, part of what was going on there was um, to, to help provide that information before getting the app with the, uh, with the recognition that people are less likely to download the app without having a great deal of confidence about the study. And, and you know, downloading the app is a major step towards participating, so we didn't want to just put that information into Ethica, you know, you have to have Ethica app in order to, to read all about Ethica, or sorry, read all about the study. We wanted that information to be available before and, and have a video. But Ethica itself supports rich multimedia content, including in the, um, the sort of consent component of Ethica. You may remember that study description and uh, it could provide a link to the same video. It's just you can't rely on them having the Ethica app. Um, now, that study also, Mohammed, if, if I'm not mistaken, 
when they clicked on the website, um, there was a link on the website that they would click on, it would download the app and, and basically request, and, and basically say, so they click on that link, the link was like, you know, join study or something. It would download the app and through that link also put them in to call up the app for that study. Actually, they had a custom app. Now that I think about it, they had a custom branded app with Alberta Health Services logo on it and so on. And it would, it would load that up. And by the same token, as Mohammed showed you the, yesterday, you can have a link, which when you click on it, um, downloads the app and sort of um, has you uh, go you say, I want to join this study. And then you go through the process of saying, do I really want to join it based on the consent form in the, in the app? So there is that option of, of um, it's sort of in one fell swoop downloading and saying, I want to join to the point where you then read the consent form and decide, do I really want to join? Um, but they had this website that was more extensive, included a video before doing that. Um, so thank you, Mohammed, for, for, uh, for refreshing our memory. I think that's something that Charles also interested. Um, so, um, Recruitment schemes um, remotely uh, are, are definitely possible for, we've engaged in a variety of recruitment mechanisms um, from you know, posters uh, around town, emails, uh, social media. Um, so Facebook and Google um, each allow ads that are quite targeted by demographics and interests and characteristics of individuals, uh, including things like the um, occupations, for that matter. Um, and uh, often very effective, um, um, uh, you know, uh, very effective, cost-effective um, uh, advertising can be done via Facebook and Google. Basically, they can provide these contextual ads that will help ensure that you recruit a patient population that is as broad as you're hoping or that's targeting a certain age group, et cetera. So this is a very flexible, um, uh, very flexible means that's readily tapped into. Um, it's something Mohammed could talk with you more about uh, than I, but uh, it's something that's, that's uh, very current. Um, there's also community sites like Craigslist that are um, that are geographically situated. Um, you know, if you have community organizers like Alberta Health Services did, those can be useful. Um, sometimes you have institutional networks. So our university, if you're recruiting at the university, we can go through the Social Science Research Lab and the Qualtrics um, sort of panel they have or the, the PAUSE uh, site. In other cases, we've engaged in snowball sampling or respondent-driven sampling to get people in networks so we recruit starting from a seed group and they mention, they provide a link to us, to their friends through a card or some sort of mechanism so that their friends have the option of opting in. This again is something where we're not allowed to get the names of their friends because their friends haven't told us they can. And so they have to tell their friends about us, not tell us about their friends mm -hmm. for, for ethics reasons. Um, it, it was quite successful, um, uh, but involves uh, a fair bit of uh, bit of work. If the study is contingent for a given individual on having network contacts that are also in the system, okay. um, uh, we have we have considered seriously AMT, uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, we have recruited. Um, people remotely for other studies that we've run in our lab. Um, in fact, we haven't gone through AMT, we've gone through other, other uh, panel of providers, uh, but have an interest in AMT, um, uh, but haven't yet taken that step. Others in our department uh, have. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's also potential for tapping into existing Ethica users uh, by notifying them of new studies, although we haven't uh, we haven't tapped that opportunity. That was part of the original uh, vision of Ethica that someone who may opt into one study may opt uh, may subsequently opt into others. Maybe they're offering the same data to two different studies, and they're 
um, if they receive compensation to, to recognize their contribution in both, but, um, but the data is being used for different types of analysis. So one question that used to come up an awful lot with smartphones is, you know, aren't you intervening with something like Ethica? So, so you have a study in Ethica, which is about a certain topic. You, you have these questionnaires that are in front of people a lot involving their, you know, physical activity or their nutritional intake or involving, um, uh, you know, their community level uh, support for physical activity or involving, um, uh, involving their use of cigarettes. Aren't you, to some degree, intervening by asking these micro questionnaires multiple times a day or multiple times a week? And the truth is, there is some, probably some impact on perceptions. You, you have these things in front of the people at all time. And, um, you know, it leads to uh, reflection on it sometimes. Um, uh, and uh, sometimes it may affect their, their sense of what important things um, uh, th their decisions are on the health front. Um, uh, and so, you know, whilst Ethica may aspire to um, understand health behaviors, exposures, knowledge, attitudes, and beliefs in a way that um, for a given study doesn't try to affect them, um, the fact is, often it has some effect, uh, likely. How big that effect is, um, our own uh, anecdotal evidence is that there is a Hawthorne effect, but it probably fades pretty quick um, for many studies. Okay? We've, we've seen some evidence of uh, earlier change and then a reversion to um, what seemed to be uh, uh, patterns that persist for a longer time. This used to be the case more when we handed out smartphones. We'd hand out a smartphone and suddenly there's the experience of having a smartphone and their life starts to change around the smartphone and, uh, and that leads them to, uh, to be very acutely aware for the first week or two but then it reverts to, to sort of um, more typical patterns. These days, with Ethica being an app on their existing phone, I'm not. I, I'm especially a little bit skeptical as to just how big the the Hawthorne effect is. But we really need to research it more. Cheryl. Question sort of related to that. Yeah. Maybe you said something I missed it, but uh, have you done any research on the effect of study? Yeah. Right. <clears throat> yeah, I think there were there was at least I think one or two other studies where we deliberately had a kind of, as you said, a burn in period where we said we'll we'll discard data from the first little bit. And certainly Tina in some of her analysis work. Tina is like the queen of analysis with Ethica. Um, and she's done a fair bit of work like putting aside data from the first day or something for, for a study or, or first half day um, or what have you. Generally, it hasn't been as long as a week, but maybe for one or two studies, um, uh, it, 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 that, that rings a bell for some studies in earlier years. Um, uh, you know, I, um, I think it's probably a, a good practice um, to do that. Um, and uh, probably we need to, to learn from those experiences. What I'd really like to do is see if we could do any sort of tests that might lend an understanding of how long that period should be and how big the effects are. It probably varies quite a lot by the content of the study, right? Um, but it's, I mean, one of the, the real advantages of, of, of Ethica as a system, and one which we designed it for, was to be able to iterate quickly, you know, roll something out kind of quickly, try it, observe, um, learn from that, fold it into a more refined study. Um, 
And, and I think something like this probably could be done as far as learning how long that initial period should be where, where you ignore the data. Um, uh, it's something we probably need to do more work on. Um, I, don't, I don't have anything too deep to say. Mohammed, have you worked with somewhere where the first week has been tossed or anything like that? Well, I was just about to say that uh, just from a technical perspective, uh, I've, uh, I had to advise this to a lot of groups to uh, just leave at least the, maybe half a day more. Because one thing I talked on the first day that if you forget I did yesterday that if you set your surveys to be prompt your study to be prompt to uh, be exactly 14 days and then you think on the 14th day you also want to issue surveys the timing of course it doesn't work because you won't get the other half of the other uh, last half day um, but the reason that we have to talk about this to quite a few groups is that they would think that they need data for 14 days and they would just go exactly for 14 days. And if they would get like half it, like for any reason, half a day of the surveys was lost, it would impact their data. Which uh, then we had to, one by one, just talk to them that if your design allows, prefer to go with 15 days or a bit more. It, there, there are a lot of human errors that can happen. There are a lot of issues uh, especially if this, this is the same study that they run in Ethica, that they they might not see it coming at first, and when they go and recruit participants, at the end they say, oh, okay, the first two days for these these issues, the data is not really useful, so we have to start from the third day, and then right. uh, there is a bit of a data loss there. So it's generally a good practice, I, 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 I from my perspective, to have that, uh, but maybe it's not possible for all. In, in some studies. Um, like the multi-thousand person study that you're spending a lot of work on now, um, which is one of, of uh, several now that, that Ethica has run that are larger uh, in size, like in the thousands. That study, um, I think you were saying that it involves some people recruited um, well before the actual study initiates for them. Anything, well, yeah, for that study, the period of the study is three years, but they recruit anyone, uh, anything between uh, one to eight months ahead of time. So they, uh, so everyone's gonna be in the study from three years and one month up to three years and eight months. Yeah. So they uh, basically uh, feel a bit more comfortable with the system, they learn how to use it. Okay. Yeah, so, um, and one other thing I'll just mention along these lines, this probably wasn't what Cheryl had in mind, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Hawthorne effect, but one thing we, we certainly see, I should really have a slide on this. Um, you know, when you do this sort of work, you need to go through all your normal care with respect to bookkeeping and keeping track of, you know, which participant um, started when and, and, um, and, you know, if you, when you're engaging with the participants, say, for um, at time of recruitment, did the study organizer walk them through, a, you know, how the surveys are answered? If so, those survey answers are not the participant survey answers. Those are the study organizer study uh, answers. And that may sound trivial, but I, I have to tell you that some of the more painful experiences, the most painful studies I've been involved with, with Ethica, uh, actually your predecessors to Ethica particularly, were studies where some basic paperwork was not done, like about the day that a certain participant started, or the exact procedure used with each participant. And so we didn't know, like, is this question, is, is this answer to a given survey from the participant or from the organizer showing it to the participant and stuff like that. And this is what Tina has had to deal with in terms of truncating data and trying to sleuth down. Did they start at you know, in the morning or the afternoon of that day, Martina has had to go through all sorts of trouble for this. And it matters sometimes because you want to know their baseline situation and, and you know, you end up, you end up um, needing to, to, to uh, tangle yourself up in knots just because the data wasn't properly recorded about, about when the survey started. Um, uh, I will mention another thing here with, with data quality. Um, let it be a lesson learned. <laughs> another thing 
that we deal with a lot with Ethica to this day, but which Mohammed is leading us to the promised land um, soon enough, is, um, is failing when we are testing a study. Often we will test the study out before deploying it. That's good practice. You, know, you, want, to, you want to test it. A better practice is if you can have a duplicate of that study, you test that out, and then you have the real study which you enroll people into. And ne'er the twain shall meet. You know, you, you don't have you don't have you know study administrators who are part of the real study and testing it out. But with a lot of studies, we have historically not done that. And we've had study administrators trying out the real study with the conviction that you know they want to try out the final draft of things. And then you start recruiting participants, and you have to be super careful to make sure who's a real participant and who's a study organizer. You know, um, and and uh, Tina's had to deal with this a lot. You know, tracking down particularly people whose phones change and stuff is is that is that you know this study organizer um, in their old phone or was this a participant or something like that? And it's it's for the birds, you know. Um, Mohammed is leading us to a situation where we can designate testers for a study that are clearly designated as being a separate group. So we know when they're in the study, it's in the capacity of testing. They are not participants, and therefore they can, they're ignored from analysis, which is you know a much better scheme. But to this point, we've had to do a lot of that manually. And Tina, um, if Tina has any gray hair on her head, it's probably because of that. Because we've had to sort these things out in ways that no young person should have to go through. Um, and I would venture no middle-aged or even <clears throat> older person should have to go through. Um, so um, in any case, that's, that's a lesson, lesson learned. And another reason, um, in as much as you're, you're just trying to get your eggs in, you know, lined up for, for launching a study, you, you probably should give a little bit of time after they get ethic on their phone, you know, before you start recording data, you know, for real, something along those lines, I'd say. Um, Tina has also done, if anyone's interested, Tina has done better work than I, anyone else I know on looking at how study adherence changes over time. So this is a big issue, right? Um, if you think study adherence is going to drop quickly after the first day, maybe you want to make you're, you're engaged in logical brainsmanship. You want to you want to make as much as best use of that first day as you can because you're afraid that after that they won't be as adherent. For a number of our studies, Tina has documented very good levels of adherence over many weeks or or you know months potentially. So um, uh, Charles' study also with uh, foodborne illness was uh, enjoyed many virtues to recommend it. One of them was continued adherence. Um, probably the best planned study. Cheryl and Harvard, uh, Harvard study are just up there um, side by side is for just exquisite levels of care and competence and delivery and, and, and strength of uh, adherence that was secured. Um, okay, so um, I noted smartphone wearable used for data collection as potential for influence uh, behavior um, and data collection mechanisms can leverage intervention um, uh, effectiveness. We kind of talked about that um, early on, um, this duality of, of, of uh, uh, interventions and, and leveraging them with data collection and understanding their effects with, uh, with data collection. Um, so common stages of the participant experience. You know, for broad studies, participants often go through a set of stages. And probably this doesn't need mentioning, but I'll just emphasize it. You know, someone encounters a, a promotion or they, they learn, uh, they, they get some awareness of the study, they learn about the study. If motivated, they take an eligibility survey. They undertake an eligibility survey, which might or might not be required. Um, uh, and, and then they're either meet with a group to get information to provide them with, uh, to walk them through an informed consent process, or they watch a video and read material that uh, provides them with um, 
the requisite understanding and maybe test that understanding with a, a little questionnaire so that we're sure that they have truly informed consent, not merely nominal consent that they rush through. Um, uh, and at some point, if they feel comfortable with it, they'll offer consent. And then there's a baseline survey. They engage in participation. And they either complete or they, they drop out, in which case they can be delivered an exit, uh, an exit survey. Um, barriers to recruitment are diverse uh, for different subpopulations. In some populations, there have been costs barriers. We're limited in how many people we can recruit because it's fairly expensive. Um, some of our early work uh, pre-Ethica involved Mohammed with weight scales. <laughs> Mohammed <laughs> did amazing jobs with uh, programming drivers for weight scales, as I recall. Um, uh, it was Wii Fit devices for any of you who remember what those are. The Wii Balance Board. Um, Mohammed used for, for gathering participants' weights. Um, uh, if you have to hand out wearables, that can be expensive, right? If you have to hand out hex shirts that are several hundred dollars or E4s that are thousands of dollars, it's expensive. Um, data plants back in the day, um, uh, working with Erica, handing out data plans, uh, it's, it's not cheap. It's not cheap to, to, to get uh, data plants. Um, uh, for low SES populations, uh, access to phones has traditionally been more of a challenge. These days, what we find is a lot of low SES populations have smartphones. They tend to have somewhat older smartphones, but they have smartphones. And studies of some low SES populations have, have emphasized just how important those phones are to their lives, to staying in touch with their social support networks that are, they depend on so keenly. Um, because of their socioeconomic challenges um, uh, and uh, because of their lifeline to resources and services that they deliver on. So we find a growing set of people in lowest, lower SES groups have phones these days. There are exceptions. Individuals who are struggling with drug addiction, um, living disordered lives, um, have difficulty keeping phones. Um, uh, you know, from the effects of intoxication, their phones can be easily stolen, um, and uh, they may have uh, trouble, um, you know, keeping them in working working order, um, keeping them charged. Um, there's uh, so that's disordered populations. Um, for complex designs, there's there can be a time-consuming per participant setup. This was um, less of a problem. Cheryl's study worked uh, very effectively um, for a complex design, uh, despite its intricate and exquisite um, uh, care with which it was designed. By contrast, the Harvard study that I referred to, uh, which was one of two we partnered with with Dana Farber, involved very time-consuming uh, setup because of network-based recruitment. In fact, we couldn't recruit an ego until their alters had committed, et cetera. Um, uh, another issue is lack of interest or incentive, uh, perceived burden. For some populations, trust is an issue. Uh, lack of awareness, uh, community buy-in, and then lack of comfort with technology. Um, this is a point of discussion with, with Erica right now. Um, we, are, we do live in a world where a growing number of our parents, if we consider those in the room, I recognize that for the youth in the back, their parents may be my junior. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, but, but for many of us um, who, who uh, benefit from the seniority of, of, of age, uh, um, our, our parents are increasingly, that generation is increasingly open to carrying smartphones. We, I'm still working my mom and dad, but, um, but you know, they're getting closer, right? Um, they're sending the text messages and, a, 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 they have to press for the <laughs> to get to the C. Um, uh, it's, it's horrible. Um, and, and they're getting to a, a position of, of being comfortable with, with uh, smartphones. But there is another level up, like 85-year-olds now, 80-year-olds. It's, it's really hard to get, um, to get them uh, carrying smartphones. And um, 
that probably is a cohort effect. As time goes on, probably 80 year olds in another five years, they may be you know, carrying around iPhones. I'm not sure. But there, there is still at the older, the, the, um, at the high ages of the age spectrum, um, challenges with, um, with phones. Once again, I point to the, to the judicious um, and wise character of, of Mohammed's leadership in the sense of, of challenging whether the Ethica app is actually a required part of Ethica studies. Because if elderly individuals could instead carry wearables, and there's a growing number of wearables aimed at elderly, including by Aura, Cerise, Salanders here in town, these very attractive jewelry-like wearables. Um, if we can capture a growing amount of their, of their sensor data and automatically collect it with wearable technologies, and if to the degree they're comfortable, they can use uh, technologies like laptops or desktops that they may have um, used uh, in their earlier days instead of a, a smartphone, that provides extra avenues for involvement of this older age cohort. Um, there will be some individuals who, are, who don't want to be involved in technology, but even for them, carrying jewelry-like wearables may actually provide some ongoing insights in a way that obviates the need for smartphones. Erica. because uh, some of our collaborators uh, in other countries um, have commented on the um, challenges associated with working with school boards and boards of education you know, in, in their context um, and have lamented how, how difficult navigating those permission systems is and, and getting, building those relationships. Um, uh, here in Saskatchewan, we've been very fortunate in, in that regard, and Tarun has done a great job, but I'm aware of, of just how uh, impenetrable the, the, the prospect can be elsewhere. Um, we have recruited from other venues. Uh, for example, uh, YMCA's, um, YWCA's uh, are another institutional context which has some um, Solidity to it, and um, where there's uh, you know group activities, um, and often people leading them who are promoting health healthy uh, living, and uh, may may serve as a point for recruitment. We've had a lot of good luck working in this province as well with uh, YMCA's. Um, uh, there's also been some discussion about uh, programs like. Uh, participation and, and sort of uh, fitness oriented programs that are out there, some of which are delivered through schools and I think some of which are outside of schools. Um, um, maybe, you know, youth sporting events I can't speak to, but, but it, maybe there's, there's opportunities there. Now, when you're getting to those, you're getting to, you know, not, not as broad brush, broad, broad a set of recruited individuals as from uh, primary schools or, or from secondary schools. Um, so, so there's some trade-offs there. But uh, I agree with you that in some cases schools are, are, are good, good for a starting point. In other cases one needs to build relationships um, for a while before going there and trying out youth recruitment uh, separately. and. Um, you know, I, I, I've given some ideas there. There's probably many others that, um, uh, that I'm, uh, you know, that you might be more uh, aware of and, and some brainstorming could reveal as, 
as good uh, good points. Um, there certainly are a lot of activities these days that are focused outside on um, on encouraging healthy youth activity. You know, I, I wonder about uh, um, some of the the work, for example, in preschools, um, which are which are another environment and a lot more varied and less highly highly uh, regimented compared to. There's a lot more variety of, of preschool environments for the youngest ages, um, uh, and it may be there's some you know uh, private school activities or or um, or, or activities outside that draw subsets of students like Kumon or others that that possibly could be um, partners for for healthy work maybe maybe youth soccer youth uh, hockey or something like that um, just some ideas um, off off the cuff I will say there's one other group though um, uh, Erica and talking with you where I think there's specific needs in terms of various recruitment. And you and I talked and conjectured about how much of the problems, for example, in the COPD study, how many of the challenges with recruitment we're finding because of the age group, and to what degree we're dealing with individuals who are so overwhelmed by the health issues they're dealing with that, and particularly at the time that we encounter them, like the particular point in their hospital trajectory, that they don't feel empowered or they're not ready in terms of their mind share to, to opt in. And it may be the same individuals, you know, two months hence, um, uh, in an in a outpatient context, or in a context of some sort of other encounter, might be in a position to opt in. It's just following a hospital stay, maybe things are topsy-turvy, they're thinking about, you know, modifying their home and getting that home oxygen in place, and, how they're going to deal with this issue or that issue with driving, and it may be that it's just too much too soon to, to recruit there. Um, so there, it may not be a matter of just is it is it the right group or can we get this group? It may be what's the right and not just the right location, but the right time to bring up the question. This is part of my my thinking on it. Okay, um, time is is a fleeting. Um, uh, I mentioned network recruitments. Um, network recruitment can be very valuable, um, but it has its own uh, challenges and sort of ripple through effects. If if my ability to be recruited depends on my having um, alters, the people in my network who are recruited, we're doing sort of an egocentric network context. Um, that that complicates the whole decision making about who's allowed to participate and the effects of opting out on the part of an individual. Um, uh, yeah, so we had talked about r remote recruitment. Um, In-person recruitment, uh, very valuable for certain needs. We talked yesterday about how certain types of Ethica data sources really are best dealt with by in-person recruitment. Could they be done remotely? They can be but it leaves open risk of confusion and failing to navigate the needs. An example is, uh, where is the REFOD? There she is, good. REFOD is doing, uh, is responsible for a beautiful study, I'd encourage you to look at it, um, uh, involving, um, uh, involving individuals in Bangladesh. Um, and she has a, a Bengali set of contents with an Ethica, even though Ethica itself doesn't have a Bengali version, the contents are in Ethica um, and are in Bengali, and uh, it's just the menus are still in English. And uh, she is pursuing an in-person contact uh, uh, for recruiting individuals in Bangladesh because she needs to get uh, to sense app use. And sensing app use involves some additional steps with Ethica to get them to opt in to, to app use. There's a couple more steps, and rather than trying to do that remotely, um, she argues that it's better to do in person. I tend to agree. Same thing with phone calls and SMS, which may, you may remember from Mohammed's slides, not six hours thence, uh, on these very screens uh, involved securing, so had several steps. Um, 
Uh, In-person recruitment can also be useful when you give out cards for network-based recruitment to someone you recruit and you ask them to give those cards which provide contact information for their friends or contacts to contact us as the uh, survey personnel. Um, uh, In-person recruitment lets you go through a con complex consent form, address concerns and confusions involving the phone. Um, to elicit extra information, for example, eligibility uh, criteria, to walk through system functions. I would include here, particularly thinking about the, the healthcare context, uh, Erica, um, the capacity to also go through this process with caregivers. And you know, it may be that the person with COPD is actually not the person filling out the reports of, of uh, exacerbations like coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath, then maybe sometimes it's the caregiver. And by giving that caregiver this, you know, this information, they feel more empowered. I, I recognize in this case, the caregivers are probably themselves a little bit overwhelmed and not ready, but, but it, it helps compared to just uh, trying to do something remotely, I'd say. Um, uh, you can walk through the system function, show how surveys are answered, etc. cetera. Um, uh, download additional uh, components, provide incentives like gift cards, and uh, if you have to provide phones or smart watches or weight scales, you can do so at that point of contact um, at time of recruitment. So remote recruitment can offer some real advantages. Um, uh, recruitment with uh, in-person um, uh, can offer advantages as well. Um, and uh, I would say there's some challenges with remote consent like verifying age, ensuring attention, um, uh, and making sure they really understand that you may want to have uh, a survey to test their understanding following going through that so you're sure they really, really understood that. Um, now there was a question about um, phones. Uh, I will include, I'm conscious of the time here, I will include some slides about uh, the trade-off of giving out phones. I think I actually put those slides aside. And I will circulate it, Brianna, and then we can talk about it tomorrow in some of the opening discussions. I'd be glad to comment because we have a lot of experience with giving out phones and the pluses and minuses, some of the gotchas and some of the, the real strengths of that approach, which retains its relevance for certain subpopulations, like those who are disordered um, individuals who, are, who otherwise uh, uh, cannot afford or cannot, uh, uh, are not familiar with, uh, with phones or have too old phones, et cetera. Okay? Um, if there are any questions, I'm glad to answer them um, right now. Otherwise, I'd suggest we break into our groups and we can pursue the projects. Is that okay? Awesome. Thank you for your patience and uh, I'm grateful for your attention. And we will now uh, initiate the, uh, the project progress.